Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. Scrum was designed, in my opinion, to help teams communicate better with the business. And more importantly, make sure that business knew what they could do and they could prove it. Who is Mike Dwyer? Let's start Who with that. Who is Mike Dwyer? It's a really good question. I've been asked it a lot. Uh, my daughter wants to know, uh, my new doctor wants to know, but let me tell you who I think I am. Uh, I have been doing the same thing for as long as I can remember. Uh, I'm an independent thinker. Uh, I believe looking at the left, the right, the up, the down, and choosing the path that I think I fit into the best. Um, what does that mean? Well, first of all, who is Mike Dwyer as far as technology? I'm not a technologist. My undergraduate degrees are in, in psychology and geography. Um, I have a business, uh, an MBA. Um, I used to dig graves and I worked in a factory. Uh, and I will tell you something, you learn more about how people work when you work with people. Um, the amazing thing I found out working in factories is they chose the leader. I, I, I may have been the boss, but they chose the leader. And the, the, the challenge that I learned was how to become that leader and still remain their boss. Mm -hmm. um, I then, <laughs> this, this, this is a funny true story. I'm sitting in a, in a, I work for two companies, Fisher Price and I work for Parker Brothers. You probably have had Fisher Price toys and you've had Parker Brothers games. It's a great place to do, but I'll tell you something, it's a killer market. You have between February 14th and April the 1st to ramp up production to make the money to pay for next year. Okay, so talk about fast cycle, talk about iterative work. Now, when you're on the production side of it, everybody says, oh, it's all worked out. That's not the case. It's, it's living chaos taking this paper plan and making the machines run that way. How do you do that? Well, you don't do that. The people in, in the work, what I've learned most importantly in working in the factories as an industrial engineer and manufacturing manager is the guy doing the job for eight hours a day knows more about the job than you will ever know. Ask. Mm -hmm. So asking questions became a big part of my life. Um, so here I am at Parker Brothers and somebody says, oh, there's this guy up at Wang Laboratories. Oh, I know him. And I called him up and he said, hey, what are you doing? And he says, hey, Mike, good to hear from you. I'm building a manufacturing management control system. I said, how can you do that? You've never been on a manufacturing floor. Oh, you're such a smart blankety blank, blank, blank. Why didn't you come here and help us? He said, I just might do that. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I had a well-planned uh, career path. No, it was, it was an opportunity to keep on working better. Um, just prior to that, I had also been in academia and was also fascinated with how people work with each other inside new environments. Mm -hmm. uh, I got out of that because can you imagine spending your entire life, have, uh, life work being uh, valued by some sophomore desperately trying to get a B in psychology course? That, that wasn't for me. <laughs> But uh, what got so you interested in psychology, though? Like maybe just to, to get that side of because uh, I like right? I I was very interested in how people work together, what causes them to come together, you know, what what gets into the, the formalization of a group, mm -hmm. how you move from a casual acquaintance or 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 a bump up. How do yeah. you move from that into some sort of informal working thing? What, what, are, what are the sticky points, the glues, the, 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 the connection points? And how yeah. does that progress into a formal focused environment? And then how does it mature into a bureaucracy? <laughs> I, was interested, I was interested in it from the individual's perspective, not from the group's perspective. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate to go to a university that, that had some really great professors. And uh, 
I had one professor, Dr. Wattner, who, when I was graduating, says, I want you back here next year. Here's a research grant. <laughs> and I understood, I, I said, oh, I, I wanted to be a professor. I said, that would be wonderful. Then yeah. I didn't do it and I realized that, that, that collegial, the collegial environment that one thinks is in, a, in, a, in, a, in an academic situation is pure hokum. It is no rules. Uh, and I just said, you know, I, I want to do something. And then, you know, 45 years later, I'm sitting, sitting, listening to my, 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 my daughter, who's at uh, getting her, her master's in, in, in education from Harvard, telling the dean of the Edu School of Education, sir, I don't want to get the doctorate. I want to be the person somebody writes their doctorate about. And I said, you know, it's really good to have children that are smarter than you. <laughs> uh, so um, I got to Wang and I found myself at home. Uh, mm -hmm. Wang R&D was probably the, the most exciting place to work. We, uh, we had a reputation inside the, uh, the community and inside, inside the profession of being a place where we could do anything that struck our minds. And as one of those senior officers of the company once said about our ID is that, you know, you're not going to get them to do what you want them to do. They're going to do something and you figure out, can you use that in the product line or you're going to license, take the patent and license it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, imagine having, not having to grow up mature for 10 years. I mean, so, but I had, uh, that, that went away and I had to go back and act like an adult. And what I found out is that if you focus on how to get people to work together towards a goal, mm -hmm. you can attain anything. So your job as a manager is to lead the people in that direction while providing all the, the hokum, the paperwork, the PAP, the policies and procedures that gives them that buffer point. Mm -hmm. um, I delivered several projects and was thoroughly eviscerated by the PMO. Uh, the only thing that saved me is that in one case, we saved the company from a $6 million lawsuit we did in three weeks. Uh -huh. And another case, uh, another team that was under the thumb, really under the thumb of the PMO, had a product go out and massively, massively fail. It was supposed to be the new flagship and it just turned turtle. So I came came to them and said, guys, just go, you gotta get a team room. Well, we can't get a team room. So why not? So we can only have a, a, a conference room one day a week. I said, okay, there's six guys here. Everybody sign up one day for the same conference room and you do it every <laughs> week until you're done. Yeah. And they turned around in six weeks. Um, so I was, I was constantly in a battle with the PMO. And for the most part, uh, I was, I was successful, which of course raise, raises no ire with the establishment. Yeah. So I learned from that. About... <laughs> you can't want to be loved. You got to want to be uh, respected. And mm -hmm. that brings us to, to, to Ken. Yeah. So uh, how, yeah, how did you meet Ken? Ken Schrader. All right. First time I met Ken Schwaber, he was in a conference room next to me explaining to a senior vice president of IT, I can't give you a, a, a delivery date. You keep on changing the requirements. And I said, oh, I got to know this guy. <laughs> I also met him in a class that he was, he, he, his company um, was running a, a project management scenario, simulation. And there were about 40 some odd people teams of five, sounds familiar. And this was in the 90s. And we had, we're giving scenarios to deal with and that would put in a little PDP one. And there's this little guy with short hair in the corner doing this. And uh, we won because we, the, the last question was, your senior hub developer has just given notice. He's leaving in two weeks. The product is, a, the project is in critical pass. What do you do? Well, the, the options were bring somebody else new, couldn't do that in two weeks. Uh, 
um, trust this guy or ask for an extension and take the hit for that. Mm -hmm. So we went off and I said, look, guys, we're, we're dead in the water. Either other, we ask for extension, we're dead. We bring a new guy, we're in dead. But if we're going to die, let's go with somebody who knows what they're doing. Let's trust them. And we did. And we were the only team to be successful. So that's how far back Ken's mindset was on this. Fast forward 2002, 2003, and I'm uh, going into the SoftPro. SoftPro was a very interesting company that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. It was nerd heaven. What was it like in Burlington, right? Or so? Right in Burlington. Uh, yeah. Burlington Mall in Massachusetts it was a strip mall, not the, not yeah. the big mall, a little strip mall behind there. And it was a, a bookstore. You walked in and it had dozens of copies of every book you never wanted to, never wanted to ever read, but you had to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And in the corner, they had this little uh, uh, conversation pit, if you want to call it that. And there's, I hear this voice. I know that voice of somewhere. I walk over there and that's Ken Schwaber. And he's talking about something called Scrum. And what the heck is Scrum? Like, rugby what this guy this guy was and i sat down and i listened to him and i just looked at him and said i know you and he looked and said yeah says, i know who you, i know you and i want to learn more <laughs> so i went over and i bought the coloring book yeah and uh that was the beginning of it uh that was beginning but i think that was also the beginning of my involvement with the scrum alliance and the agile alliance because uh agile new england which we both know yeah once agile was bazaar called, was right. once called the agile bazaar and yeah. the scrum alliance website was also called control chaos <laughs> i didn't know that, that one, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah well control chaos was ken's website and his motto at that time it's all common sense yeah Okay, and so we started saying, where is that on the periodic table? And the joke got, well, it's the, rarest, it's the rarest element in the world. And we just had a wonderful time with it. Um, but it wasn't all about common sense. It still so, is today, right? About common sense. And a lot of it's, times it's, we over. It's buried a lot inside the lingo, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think, maybe just to stick on Ken and Jeff, where do you think they got their ideas? I mean, I think a lot of us know, and but I want to get your perspective on um, where do you think Ken and Jeff got their ideas for Scrum? Um, well, there used to be a Usenet group for um, small talk. Yeah. And uh, I was working as a government contractor in the day. And uh, someone told me about this. Now, this is, I was down in Cambridge, in, in, in uh, at Kendall Square, right in, the, right in the middle of it, standing behind the guys from Lotus, getting lunch and the, and the thing, and uh, listening to all the stuff. And uh, so I kind of, kind of lurked inside the Usenet group and the small talk. And they were talking about, you know, Screw this stuff about all these this, these project plans. We got to get this done and that done. How do we smoke it? Blah, blah, blah. And they're talking about this small, tight work. And, and it was all about test first, test first, test first, test first. Yeah, so these I were know, probably the XP guys or? Oh, no. This was, yeah, it was the XP. It was Ward. It was, it was uh, uh, Jeff. It was. Um, uh, I mean, Ken, Ken, I spoke with Alistair, Ken. Alistair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was Martin, okay? Yeah. And it was all about heavy duty, hard, hardball coding to get the work done. Done, yeah. And it all boiled down to, they don't know what the heck they want. They being business. Yeah. And that led to the whole test first model, okay? And it, it led to uh, uh, some really great work in testing the whole test first my exploratory testing mm -hmm. um but that's that that's where the energy started and the, the 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 agile manifesto most of the guys that came to that i believe were on small talk yeah um what do you think uh, as far as like you know i, I want to get your thought on you know xp uh was probably at one time more popular than Scrum. 
and uh, had a bigger maybe movement. And then probably with Ken and Jeff, uh, specifically with Ken, you know, uh, with Scrum Alliance, that kind of propelled and uh, it was almost like a, a market. I don't know. Uh, uh, definitely Scrum became what people associated with Agile. What are your thoughts on just how uh, XP and, and Scrum evolved and how Scrum became the what people associated with Agile? Oh, I'm going to give my personal opinion. Yeah. I never I, did I you. <laughs> a project without XP. Yeah. Okay, even before I knew it was called XP. I, I, my technical prof proficiency is in testing at the enterprise level. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm amazed and amazed it when it gets to unit testing. Okay. I'm okay. But if you give me an enterprise level testing with layers and layers of stuff, I'm a happy dude. It's, it, it, it's got enough to keep me interested. But what, what, what at all levels, it becomes what's the expected outcome? And then what are the parameters around that outcome? And I, I, I totally buy into, and I totally support Jeff and Ward and Chet in XP. If you, matter of fact, if you, if you talk with Chet, I don't know if you have or not. I have, yeah. He will tell you that the way he builds a product is first get the functionality to work. If the customer wants two plus two to add to three, figure out how to do that and get the customer to sign up. That's what I want. And then go back and refine it to meet all the other parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay lines of code and you hammer it down and then you, you, you laminate, you layer, you stratify, and then you constantly back and forth integrate. That, that's the essence of writing good code. I love my conversations with Ron, okay? but we just disagreed. We disagreed on-, on This is Ron Jeffries, for, right? Ron, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that, that he helped me explain to myself and to others where I was. And I think at times I helped him understand the difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, but but Ron was Ron is adamant about the fact that this is um, about writing writing good code. It's a software model, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not sure that I, I think we built we've gone. Uh, we need to take and abstract the value of, of XP and the logic flow of XP and make sure we implement it in other environments. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, hats like off, hats off to like Ward that. and Ron <laughs> and, 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 and Bob Martin. We yeah. wouldn't be here. For, it wasn't for them. Yeah. Or Ken either. I mean, like well, no, and, and yeah. Ken made that happen because he, and in my opinion, he and Jeff, at, I, uh, at IDEX. No, I meant Ken Beck. Uh, as oh, far Ken as Beck. Like when, yeah. Um, but Ken, and maybe to come back to Ken Schreiber, um, you took his first or one of the first classes that's from yeah, the line. I think it was the first that, or second public class. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> uh, I think anybody that took one of his original classes and, and played the George Steinberg game. Um, <laughs> Still is traumatized. <laughs> um, and he instilled the problem you're dealing with unreasonable, yeah. uh, uh, unlogical product owners or business that want you to figure out how to make them happen. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn how to say yes, no, and I don't understand. And he did it. He did, he did it so well. I mean, uh, of all the, and I, you know, you know, I, I, my, my trainings and coaching is all about simulation. Yeah. Um, but I learned a lot in those, those two days and I had a lot of fun. <laughs> and that led to a relationship with Ken and with Jeff um, that I still cherish today. Yeah. It's crazy that small area outside of Boston. I mean, like that, uh, it, you know, I used to drive through Lexington in that area from Rhode Island going up to Maine from uh, college. And uh, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, Burlington is on that way too, um, you know, by 95 and all of that. So it's, 
Um, but maybe to move from Massachusetts to Colorado, the first uh, scrum meeting in Boulderado, what was that like? Because <laughs> oh. I, I get stories from people and people. The, so what, what's your memory of? Uh, OK, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at home. Um, my company, uh, Three Sided Coin, is floundering. It was, a, it was the middle of the, uh, the dot com bust. Mm -hmm. uh, I had had two small contracts, none of which to do with software. And I get this. This email says you're invited to the to, to the uh, scrum gathering in Boulder. Huh? Okay, so um, I check into it. Okay, fine. I'm, I'm, then I said, well, I'm not going to come. I mean, too many people. No, no, no. It's only going to be I think fifty or sixty people. Yeah. Maybe there's thirty. But I get there, and there's Ken and Mike and Esther, and they Mike got Cole, right. Yeah, Michael, and yeah. they've got other people there too, and everybody's doing their spiel. And there's this energy about you know, where we're going with this thing, and and Ken is pulling and pushing, and Mike is pulling and pushing. And yeah. to be honest with you, I was more aligned with Esther. What was her take on this? Yeah. Re the importance of retrospectives. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do we? How do we? We, how do we plot where we are and delta to and figure the delta where, where we want to be and what's the next small tack we take in our course mm -hmm. um and i have always had a uh a, a soft part for the pain esther can inflict on me <laughs> uh but there was a lot of energy there was a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, I don't remember too many things other than sitting in front of Ron Jeffries and looking at him and saying, you know something, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing. He said, what the hell you doing here? Like, oh, why are you here? Ken invited me. Well, see, here's part of Ken. He knows people that add value. Mm -hmm. And he knew Ron added value. So did Alistair. Okay. Uh, so he so had that uh, neck for like understanding, like uh, essentially looking ahead, understanding who can help with his vision. Because it, it, it is clear to me now that uh, in some ways, can had an idea and vision because I don't think maybe this is something that I, I want to get your opinion on. Uh, do you think uh, that Scrum and Agile would be where it is today without Ken? Like if you take Ken out of the picture? No, I don't think so. I, and I'll tell you why. When the Agile Alliance began, Ken was Ken was a plank owner. Ken, the Agile Alliance was was, was pretty amorphous, pretty uh, uh, passive, I guess is the term. They mm -hmm. wanted to, to, to very much uh, let it generate itself and let it go out freely to the people. Uh, Ken, I think, believed in all that, but also Ken saw the need to have some sort of uh, statement, some sort of mark about agility that you could measure. Mm -hmm. He also wanted to make money. Well, I don't blame him for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, if you can do this all, all, all in goodwill, then you know, send me send me a donation. I can always use a donation. Um, so, in at the end of the first Agile conference, which I forgot where that was, it was this meeting. Yeah. He contacted a bunch of people. Says, I mean, wasn't it like somewhere in Europe? The split? Yeah. I uh, thought the first, no. The, 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 I'm talking about the split between the Scrum Alliance and the Agile Alliance. Oh. I remember walking this into is where a, This is where Mike, uh, Ashton, and, uh, and Ken uh, kind of was, they had some type of conversation or something like that, right? Well, they had a conversation oh, sorry, and they called a bunch of people together. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to start the Scrum Alliance as part of the Agile Alliance. 
them. And I was and Mike was saying when I interviewed Mike Cohn, he was saying like in a sense it was really like somebody else from uh, I can't recall the guy from Canada that almost started as an incubator inside uh, Agile Alliance. But then morphed into something, uh, you know, the scrum right. lines that we. And I, I don't, I, I don't remember that guy, okay? Because yeah. I was more interested in listening to again how the Agile Alliance was talking about people working together, and mm-hmm. what was missing was how individuals work with each other. Okay, um, mm-hmm. they were going. Uh, I felt this, the Agile Alliance is going in a very soft direction. And from my experience inside industry and business, I realized that, there, that, that there's a, a lens, a focus that has to be to that interaction pattern. Mm-hmm. And that's why I, went, I, went, I was more strongly involved in the Scrum Alliance. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. That's really interesting. And like every time I uh, speak to somebody that's been involved, and that uh, I get, you know, better and better picture of, uh, uh, of what, uh, what was going on. Um, maybe uh, uh, to <laughs> uh, talk about a couple of funny things that I've uh, heard you say before, but like uh, Scrum Master is a sheepdog. Could you talk about that and share that? <laughs> so we were talking about well, the Scrum Master was somebody who was supposed to protect the team. So um, I'm going to lay this on Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen came in and walked up to Mr. Schwaber and went, woof, woof. And that was a secret greeting between scrum masters. We were sheepdogs, and we all had to know who we were. Woof, woof. Sniff, sniff. And it, it. Got to be funny. Yeah. And periodically we'll remind each other of that with a wolf wolf sniff sniff and, and a comment. <laughs> what about wow. uh, the uh, uh, another one that I like that you I've heard you say when we uh, spoke in the past is uh, um, and in relation to scaling, um, uh, small scrum people and big scrum people? Yeah, and this is this is a bit of an axe of mine, I guess. Um, yeah. And I'll ask you this: How many small team situations have you gone into coach and they and you're successful? And go, oh wow, we want more. Did you ever not have that happen? Mm-hmm. Always, <laughs> or most. Okay, of the so time. here we are, wildly successful. And I mean, when Scrum initially happened. Uh, in my own experience, I was brought into contract with a small company that was uh, doing incredibly valuable work with, 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 with um, ill people. And the board is going to shut them down because they couldn't control the IT process. They couldn't meet the customer's needs. So mm-hmm. I got brought in by a friend who had just been made vice president of development. He said, Mike, I just made I was just promoted to uh, offer the job of vice president of, of development as blah, blah, blah. I said, well, congratulations. He says, I'm not going to take it unless you come here. <laughs> Let's so uh, I went there. Yeah. yeah. I went there and the president of the company couldn't stand me. And the reason is, he was the biggest disruptor of all. Every time a customer called up a big problem, he would take an old hand crank air raid siren, mm-hmm. walk out in the middle of the development area, go, ah, we got a problem. <laughs> and everybody's about 20 years old. So I said to my buddy, I said, I'm like, we got to stop this. We're not going to stop that. I said, Let me try. I walked in, they said, I think you're a genius to the present. You built this out of nothing, no funding, and it's going like rock and roll. So I'm going to totally adhere to your principle that when you bring out that air raid siren, we're going to shut everything down. We're going to reorient and just do that and drop everything else. And his eyes got about this big. So you're going, what? So, well, I mean, you're the visionary. Uh, we can't do all these things. We're going to do them all half-assed bad. So whenever you do that, I promise you, we will dump on that. And that's the only thing we'll do until we got it fixed. He looked at my buddy and said, is he serious? And he goes, oh, yeah. He did that the last place we worked. 
Um, I got control of the development teams and they grew six fold in nine months, no, in, in 18 months. And when they were acquired, one of the reasons they were acquired is they couldn't believe that they could keep this the development staff the same size and increase their, their, their market share and their volume and have high customer satisfaction ratings. So I went to the other company and they couldn't do it. I was there five, I said, I'll stay six weeks. I was there four and a half years and I left. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all about managing trust in you and their agreement that if you screw up, you're dead, which is one of my axioms for, 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 for coaching and scrum and agile is it's, we have great freedom, right? We are, we are free of the one great anxiety and the old people who work here is I'm going to get fired because we know something we're not going to be here forever that's that's exactly. that's liberating think about it it is i can it do is. things i i can do things that nobody else can do because you can't fire me mm -hmm. okay i'm here because you need help i'm going to give you the help they don't like it i i'm i was looking for a job when i found this one <laughs> Uh, it is, and it is. Uh, uh, it's very interesting because that feeling is liberating, and it's also like as a, uh, especially as a uh, change agent, if you're coming in or helping an organization to have that mentality. And I think that same mentality can happen with people that are internal employees. Like we sometimes uh, feel like, especially for Scrum masters and like any type of change, they everybody should have that type of mentality where like. Uh, I don't know who said it, but like, you know, the scrum master should always be at risk of getting fired. Um, Cause you're, you're pushing. I had, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I had, I had senior managers say, I would never let an employee do this. You're successful, but I said, so what you're saying is you would forego six being success, mm -hmm. having success because you would want an employee to do this. Why? And they would look at me and say, what do you mean, why? I said, you, made, you, you met your goals, you kept under your budget, your employees, your, your employee numbers are good, your turnover rate's down, you're rocking it, product marketing is afraid of you, product, uh, product development can't wait to get a hold of you, they can't feed you enough stuff because you're doing so that, and you get rid of the, guy, the guys that I'm trying to make that happen. And he goes, Get out of my office you're making you're making too much sense <laughs> um, but you know i'm not i don't expect other coaches and trainers to be the same as i am why because mm -hmm. i would rather be true to the goal than have an allegiance to somebody that doesn't or can't or won't make that goal mm -hmm. So you speak as you, you, you like uh, you're still doing this, and I thought you're retired. So uh, I'm pretty yeah, sure well, you're retired. I am. I am. I am. <laughs> How I does actually, it feel? Maybe I actually like... planted my first garden in my life, <laughs> and I got I got all those gladiolas to stand up straight. I I gave them all the support they needed, and they're blooming. <laughs> So how does it feel? I mean, like, uh, and what are some of the thoughts when you look at, you know, kind of uh, your past experiences and, you know, what we've discussed here. And then when you look at our community and um, just in general, the movement, where it's going, what, what comes through your mind? Hmm. Well, first of all, I don't think the Scrum Alliance would be here today if, uh, uh, if Howard was not the chief product owner. Mm -hmm. uh, he embodies in my mind what we need to help man companies understand that they have to have on board with them. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as CEO, but as but, but as maybe master of the ship. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, uh, the Scrum Alliance that 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 I was part of has morphed. Uh, it's no longer concerned with delivering an outcome in a specific time increment. 
we used to argue, you know, almost had jihadic arguments about definition of done. Yeah. They're not. They're not happening. Is that because uh, we decided it's too hard, or that it's not our purview anymore? So we're more into a soft statement about Scrum than we were in the past, and I think that's probably due to a shift in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we are away from uh, mostly hard coders, the uh, the Martins. Uh, uh, the, the Hendricksons, um, the Becks, the Cunninghams, um, and we're into people that uh, are using uh, uh, these development tools. Okay, mm -hmm. now I am old school. Okay, given a choice of learning some new language or, or dicing out what's going on on the registers, I hope choose the registers. I have absolutely no trust in anybody who writes a language. Okay, because as a professional tester, my first job was to understand how how the language was put together and how it makes itself to understand where to go poke holes in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the movement is is moving in that direction. I am not sure that. I could work in a distributed environment because I need to read people in a group. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Uh, over the years, I have developed a couple of techniques, one of which is the simulation I use, which is basically uh, a two-phase. One is a Kobayashi Maru. No matter what you do, you will fail. And then... And it's, it's fun. I mean, at any level, I've done it with kindergartners all the way up through executives and, and PhDs. First, the first thing, the first round, everybody blows one way or another. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the power of the retro. And I also remind them. Be able this, to learn, yeah. Inspect and adapt. <laughs> it's a more, the more important thing is, I say to them, you failed. Okay. So get rid of that angst. You failed, okay? You blew it. You spent too much time. You didn't deliver enough. You delivered the wrong stuff, okay? Or you gained the situation, but you failed. But here's why you failed. You didn't listen to each other. How are you going to do this better? So maybe I, was, I said, I okay, so what are you going to do differently? So so why don't you ask these different teams what they did and what they saw you doing? And so they would talk to you and say, okay, now you understand conversation. The question is, how do you get better? It is, you, you will not fail if you get better. That's how you It's also making measured. it okay, making it okay to fail and that failure is okay, that you are learning, right? And acknowledging that in that instance or that simulation, that you're talking about it it's almost giving them permission that hey it's okay more, more than giving them permission telling them that failure small failures lead to big successes fast mm -hmm. okay and then we play the second round and i get to play more with the dynamics of the people i was in a seminar once and i learned this really cool trick um you know, you, you've had scrum masters or people in projects and they're just so excited and getting it done. And they start talking and talking and talking and they, they suck up all the air. So I learned this technique. I walk around and say, well, Lon, you've got to learn Jadis. Your doctor just called, you can't talk. Okay, the only thing you can do is nod your head or like this or like this with the other team members. But you got to get this done team, figure it out. The lesson that comes out of that is the team is more than happy to sit back and wait for you to, to kind of do it. And Tell then it's them. your fault. No, no, then it's yeah. your fault for not making it, right? Yeah. Ah, but now the team's got to step up and you have to listen. And all of a sudden, better ideas coming up. But, but then I explained to the, to, to the scrum, everybody's a scrum master. I said, here's the problem. When you do that, you lay yourself open to be criticized. It isn't us, it's you. Don't do that. And everybody said, wow, that makes total sense. 
Um, so those are a couple of things that, that, that I learned because remember my focus initially was mm -hmm. on the individual interacting with the team and how to improve not just the individual, but the team. And it all mm -hmm. gets back to listening. Listening and probably empathizing too, trying to understand and maybe to come to this uh, back to, um, you, you know, like where, where do you see, like, for instance, um, the, you know, maybe to come back to scaling or to talk about scaling frameworks to like these different frameworks and methods. Do you, do you see Scrum still kind of being predominant? Do you see like uh, people just uh, trying to adopt and contextualize things? Like what is your thought? Like, um, you know, maybe for, I'm sure uh, some of the people from our community will be listening to this um, uh, as a reflection back on what you've done. Um, maybe what are, what are your thoughts as far as what should our community or community members be focused on and where are we going from your perspective given that you're now outside or maybe looking a little bit from well, outside no no, no. i i haven't given up my license i'm i'm on sabbatical <laughs> uh, but you're uh, are you still uh are you still monitoring some of the discussions and <laughs> i'm not going to say yes or no <laughs> um i will tell you this i i'm taking time off and I'll, let me let you just interject this a lot sure. of the people listening to this conversation are going to be trainers and coaches, and they're going to be fully involved, like 25,000%. You can't do it. I'm a proof of this. The last five years I worked from, uh, from 15 to 20, or actually 15 to eight, the last three years, um, I had lost my spark. My, my body was yelling at me. It took me two years to get my doctor to get off my back. Uh, you know, this is not a healthy lifestyle. Not when you're traveling 48 weeks out of the year. This is not a healthy lifestyle dealing with all the pressures we have. So make some moderation there. And the other thing is understand why you're in it. If you're in it for the money, you're in a death spiral. You know, we were at $1,400 a, a seat. You're now down to 400 a seat. Mm -hmm. All right. We were highly interactive face to face. And um, now you're mostly distributed looking at a screen. Mm -hmm. There's that chemistry. Part of the interaction, and I'll tell you one of the things I learned because I, I had a very interesting roommate when I was doing my research. He was a, a biochemist. And we're talking about interactions. He went, phenomes. Said, what are you talking about, phenomes? He said, phenomes have a direct, a direct uh, impact on how we interact with each other. You mean how I smell? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I haven't really delved into that because I cannot memorize all these big, long words. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, I, that's one thing I don't think I want to do or could do. Um, when you feel like you're meddling at home, put away the postage stamps, Figure, take some time off, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have to find a way to get people to want to work towards a goal. Now, I, I think one of the things that I, I'm concerned about in the Scrum Alliance and, 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 and in all coaching is that we are not coaching people to, to, to forge the tip of the spear to make progress. We're not finding ways to get people to buy into this. Uh, there's a book, and that's because we focus too much on leadership. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, a leader does not exist unless there's somebody following them. And rank does not equate to respect. One of the things that I think we need to do as agilists, as scrumsters in particular, is put power back into the team member, understand they are the ones that do the work. And a product owner is there to help them understand what the customers change their mind to. And the, scrum, and the scrum master is there to protect them and to encourage them and listen to them and support them in voicing their opinions towards that goal. Mm -hmm. I think that way, I think, to a great extent, we have lost that. 
We're trying to make people feel good about themselves. This is not something we do in business. You, how many days a week do you feel really wonderful about everything you've done? All right. So you think you're yeah. different than anybody else. So our job is to take a group of people and help them figure, you know, there's going to be the, the up days, the down days, and then there's going to be the days we work every day. I think how there's do, also that vision, right? Like that vision helps us, motivates us, understanding like how do we create uh, something or purpose there's something that people will be uh, so, you know motivated intrinsically not you know to to, to 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 not you know in a sense design a system where it reinforces people to to try to solve problems and they believe in solving those problems rather than um, you know just talking about it who should be doing what so uh, what if what if what if we did this more supposing that we fed them, righteously fun, wicked, good problems, mm -hmm. and then worked with them to understand all how the failures help the customer, the, problem, the business, understand what they can't happen mm -hmm. and what the team can learn how to do better. Quick, a quick story. I had a client and they wanted to have this really great thing for heart healthy. And they built this matrix up and said this and this and this and this. And I said, they said, and code that. And so I sat down with my technical guy and, and I said, he said, we can't code that. And I said, so let me work with them. So now my job was to go to the customer to, over a period of uh, uh, twice or three, three uh, times a week day meetings, going through their logic with them until they understand it was wrong. And explains that we were trying to do this and it failed and here's how it failed. These are the conditions where, and they would come back and they finally said, we still think it can be done, but we understand that, that, that the logic, not us, the logic mm -hmm. isn't there. Do we teach product owners to do that? No. Why? Yeah. This is, this, the advocacy is what I think we're missing and, and, and the leadership because we don't get into team first. Yeah. And that's uh, it's, it's a really good point, Mike, because a lot of times we still feel like, and I like, you know, we need to kind of drive and, and um, I'm, I'm just thinking about like, not necessarily Scrum Alliance, but in general, like that team first and just giving people, like you said, like that. <laughs> I love how you threw in there the wicked problems um uh earlier uh you know give them the pro we can good problems or interesting problems to solve and let give them a little bit more autonomy to and trust them something that you've said um so uh that really resonates and it's like you know to come back to the beginning um it, it's that the, the simplicity going back to the, to the fundamentals you know and what this whole <laughs> Moment. Start, really, Milan, if we started asking people, what's the outcome you want? Mm -hmm. What's the outcome you can deliver based on what we told you? And we started refining the outcome. It would change. Mm -hmm. One last thing. I'll, I'll maybe one of the last things. You asked me what got me started on this, this book. Uh, 1976. Yeah. If you read this book, you'll find everything about Agile, Scrum, uh, lean and thin management. It's all here. So if you want to know the, right. the, the, sor the source of my... Burn up like, the organization, yeah. And who's the author? Robert Townsend. Oh, okay. Great. So He's maybe... Yeah, I'll, I, I never actually heard about the book. The cover looks kind of familiar, but I don't, I don't know. I'm going to get it uh, and uh, check it yeah. out. Well, you've heard you've heard the comment. Well, let's take the man, the man, the man. Let's be the man from the moon, the Mars, coming to look at this problem. <laughs> so Townsend was running Avis. Avis had a problem. It was number two. They were getting clever by Hertz. So he came and said, "Let's make that our model. We're number two. We try harder." <laughs> it's in the book. Yeah. And then he had this really thing cool. about they were trying to figure out well, how to do things like where to put the new corporate headquarters. So he looked at everybody and says, okay, so let's pretend we're the man from, man from Mars. Coming down and we asked this man from Mars, where should we put it? 
what questions would he would, would, would we ask? Well, where are the two biggest concentrations in your people? Well, one was Kennedy, and the other one was Manhattan. He said, oh, well, maybe we should put a right between two of them. <laughs> and the other thing that, that I think most companies don't do is they don't take people in the office and make them go down and work on the work in front of the customer. Mm -hmm. He talks about, about financial people running in terror when they had to actually address a customer, an irate customer. Mm -hmm. And when I worked at Fisher Price, every manager had to work on the floor, on the shift, but preferably third shift for a month to understand mm -hmm. where their paycheck came from. And that was a more of a practice with lean and uh, earlier on and uh, like you had to you had to like understand the work that people um you were doing and have at least a little bit more context rather than you know um maybe to finish uh with like what are some of the other things that you would like to uh share or maybe uh, that i didn't ask you what are some of the other things that we want to make sure that we record here you and I have had a lot of <laughs> discussions, so uh, there are some really good stuff. Uh, I'm trying to think about if there's anything else, but is there anything that comes to your mind uh, that we didn't discuss or that we should bring up here? And some of the stuff shouldn't be recorded, but <laughs> some of the stuff that <laughs> <laughs> that can be recorded. Um, I'd have to think about that. Um... I, I think that I, I, I would like to see a bigger, un, us have a bigger understanding of the followers. Mm -hmm. You know, because followers literally choose their leaders. You could be the greatest orator in the world if no one showed up. You're just a guy standing on a soapbox in the, in the middle of the street, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to help followers, ourselves included, understand how to discriminate good leaderships based on the outcomes we personally want. Mm -hmm. And make sure that we're doing that for us, not just for our individuals. And that's where I think Scrum, I think Scrum in a more dynamic sense, okay, plays a major mm -hmm. role. We need guides, we need doers, we need an outcome, we need an interface, but more importantly, who do we choose? And you know, in mature teams, as you probably have happened, you can't tell who the product owner and the scrum master is sometimes. Exactly. And, and uh, that's, that's a, a level four team. Mm -hmm. And right. a true, true, true self organization where, right. you know, the lines start getting blurry as far as who does what. But that's true on the same, like, you know, if you think about good sports teams, I, I tell people, you might have superstars, you might have, but on really good teams, nobody's saying he's a defender, I'm a scorer. Um, it, it's just whatever it takes to win. And uh, those lines start getting blurry uh, as far as, like, you know, what the expectations are. It's like whoever can chip in and help. I crewed in college, you know, rowing. Yeah. Um, and people say, well, what, what, what does that sport entail? I said, it's not much. I said, just find yourself a balance meet. Find eight guys who are over six feet tall. So they can do calisthenics backwards for three and a half to four minutes and constantly in increase the rate of, of the frequency of the calisthenics. And then have a little guy at the end of it or a little person at the end of it yelling and screaming and calling you nasty things. And do that every day. Okay. It's all about the goal, the outcome that you're willing to subject yourself to that abuse. And I will tell you it is abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if I were to say anything, and, and, and I dearly love Howard because he's doing this gently. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is it that we want to do? What is it we can do? And how do we get there as things change? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, yeah, I'm a fanboy of Howard's, but that's because I know the guy. No, it's him. great. I mean, especially if you, t you know, like I think what Howard has done, what Melissa has done um, is, and together, it's been amazing because if you look at previous leadership, 
and what has happened. Um, I think we're finally on the right track um, and that we truly have to have, we have the potential to, as a community, uh, to be what Scrum Alliance stands for, which is Organization for Impact and, and have an impact on a broader world. So I think, you know, uh, time will tell, but well, I agree. Don't forget like, this, is that we would not be here if someone didn't have the, the focus, the commitment, the vision, and that was Ken. And also someone like Jeff, who went out there and practic practiced this mm -hmm. to refine uh, the abstract in an R&D setting. Ken was working in IT settings, mm -hmm. okay? And then driving up and down the layers. We wouldn't be here. If it hadn't been for that, we wouldn't be here without Ken Rubin. We wouldn't have been, been here without Jim Cundiff mm -hmm. or Mike Cohn. I mean, these are all important people. And they are. And I think we forward. all, at least I know I'm very thankful for to you, to others uh, that you just mentioned and many other unnamed or unmentioned uh, who contributed to, to this movement. Because I think it is something special that was an accident like from <laughs> from Snowbird to all of this, it, most of it was, um, you know, in a sense, unplanned and it evolved into something that I think is great and uh, in many ways. Well, Steve, you weren't around in the days of the Endless Project. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, if you look, there's a video out there called the Bradley Fighting Machine. Yeah, read, watch that that disaster. But many of us worked on projects that never got anywhere. Mm -hmm. And what agile? Did I mean, I've definitely with... worked on projects, and I, I've gotten my taste of, of what was happening. But probably on the tail end of a lot of that traditional right. what was happening in eighties and nineties. But I, imagine, uh, uh, imagine uh, the the, the earth shaking statement that kind of rocked the project management world they said all projects can be no longer than 18 months mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it was a year then six months that was all precursors to where we are now mm -hmm. also the era of where project managers would say this is what i want you can't do that and people would literally say it's in there you find it <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I mean, like, so some people that, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the people that I'm mentoring and, and some of the people that you even see in classes, like, never experienced any of that. They're younger, you know, maybe in early 20s. And um, it's like they can, you know, uh, a phantom working in that type of environment. But uh, it, well, it's interesting here, how far. It's <laughs> because we couldn't work in that. <laughs> And, and to some, I think, you know, the current way of working, it still doesn't feel natural. So I think there's still a lot to uh, do, but I agree, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, with where we had it and uh, the leadership, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm glad to be, especially part of Scrum Alliance community and also part of this whole bigger movement. So um, anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Let me leave you with this last thing. Um. This pandemic has, has revealed a lot of interesting data. We all expected the economy to tank. We all expected um, productivity to be awful, be, to be disharmony. And yet you look at the numbers, productivity's up, margins are up, revenue's up. All these people worked at home. So, Maybe the next big question the Scrum Alliance and the Agile Alliance needs to answer is, why are they bringing people back into offices? What value does that add? That should take care of the next 15 years.